I'm born for the Black Street Wood people and the Bitterwater clans of the Jene people from the occupied territories known as the Southwest United States. I want to begin our panel by first acknowledging the Ainu peoples, the ancestors and descendants of the, of the original stewards of this beautiful landscape. But I also want to acknowledge the descendants and displaced peoples of Hiroshima. For although it's an honor to be here, I also carry a responsibility to acknowledge our heartbreaking connection. For it's from the Diné lands and the lands of the Lakota people that the uranium was sourced to start the Manhattan Project. This is why it is so important in a time of global urgency for the solidarity of indigenous peoples from around the globe to not only be a part of the decision-making processes that will lead us forward into a new, more equitable and just future, but that are also at those decision-making um, meetings as leaders of the sustainable development solutions that we so desperately need. That is the role of the Indigenous Peoples Major Group and the development of the Right Energy Partnership, which is developing the standards necessary to ensure that we take a rights-based approach in all of our conversations about the development of renewable energy and the transition that is necessary to get our communities to the type of world and energy future that we need. It is my privilege to moderate this panel of experts sitting before you today, and we will begin our session with Mr. Hidaki Umera. He's the sixth president of the Shimin Gaiko Center and professor at Kaisen University. In 1982, he established the Shimin Gaiku Center, or the Citizens Diplomatic Center for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which started in order to support the Ainu people and the Roku people. In 1998, he began a UN ECOSOC NGO, and his background has been used to help indigenous peoples, for he studied international human rights law and the rights of indigenous peoples, and he is our Ainu elder who will begin our panel today. え、こういうとこで話すのあまり慣れてませんけど、ま、よろしくお願いいたします。え、この美しい日本、そして美しい京都へようこそおいでくださいました。ただ、え、美しいというのは日本は正直言って表面だけです。要するに私たちアイヌ
私たちアイヌ民族は何とか自分たちの文化を守ろう言葉を守ろうと努力してきていますでも国の政策がそういうためになかなか思うようにはいっていませんでそれじゃあ日本政府見ていただくと分かると思いますが、えー、来年2020年に東京でオリンピックが開かれることになりましたこのオリンピックが決定した途端日本政府何をやったか北海道の白老というところに国立のアイヌ民族博物館を作ろうとたった3年で博物館できるもんではありません来年の4月オープンを目指しています要するに表面を作ろうだけで本当の政策を取ろうとしてない日本まあ、えー、それはいろいろな形で現れていますまあ夕べもちらっと話してたんですけど、えー、北海道は日本の国立大学つまり帝国大学の研究の場所でもあったんですね北海道を開拓に、えー、多大な貢献を、えー、与えてくれたという、えー、クラーク博士確か彼はアメリカです多大な貢献を果たしたという意味それはなぜかというとアメリカのネイティブの政策侵略政策を北海道に持ち込んでそしてアイヌを侵略したそれをいまだに北海道へ進出したアイヌ以外の人たちは非常に素晴らしい人だと素晴らしい人だと称えていますでもアイヌにしてみれば私たちを苦しめたそれを指導したその人にしか過ぎないんですねそういうことで、えー、皆さん日本は非常に美しい国だそして素晴らしい国だと思うでしょうが人間的に果たして素晴らしいのかどうか今の私たちアイヌ民族の姿を見ると絶対それは言い切れませんでアイヌ民族だけではありません日本には多くの在日の外国人の方々がいますその人たちアイヌと同じように人間としての権利をほとんど認められていませんつまり差別の対象にされていますそれは、えー、まあ多くの国々から来ているから自分たちの日本へ来て住んでいる人たちの話を聞いたらわかると思いますみんなアイヌのように差別をされそして一つの人間としての価値を認められてないそれが今の私から言わせていただく日本の現状です、まあ、こういう機会に、えー、皆さん世界中で日本の先住民族そして日本にいる在日外国人のことを、えー、広く世界に広めて日本を誤ってるよと日本のやってること間違ってるよと、えー、プッシュしてくれれば、えー、私たちは、えー、幸いに思います、まあ、このぐらいで、えー、話を終わらせていただきます Our next speaker is Ms. Peg Putt, co coordinator of Climate Action Network's site. Wait, Sinks? Climate Action Network what? Sinks. Sinks group, working group, and environmental、uh, paper network, biomass energy co coordinator. Ms. Putt has been seen working internationally on forests and climate for Over 10 years, consulting to several non governmental organizations. She was a parliamentary leader of the Tasmanian Greens Party in Australia for a decade and recently was CEO of the NGO Markets for Change. Thank you very much. I've got some slides,、um, if you don't mind putting them up there. The first one.、Um, while they're coming up, I would also like to acknowledge the、uh, Ainu people. Um, their ancestors, their elders, and the、uh, current community, and also the indigenous peoples of all the lands that I'm about to talk about. I actually myself went and stayed in an Ainu village in 1996, and there was a big problem at that time with、uh, the construction of a hydro dam. 
that was opposed. And uh, um, I'm aware of uh, those circumstances. So, we have a slide yet? Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so this is a case where renewable energy is actually posing a major threat to indigenous peoples and their lands. It's the massive expansion of forest biomass energy, um, which is uh, underway at the moment around the globe. You can see at the top uh, picture there the demand and supply of industrial wood pellets in 2017 the um, uh, consuming countries, the demand centers are in yellow, and the producing countries, the suppliers, are in green. Now this energy form, as you know, is being promoted under um, renewable energy policies and heavily subsidized uh, in order to pr promote it. But it's coming to get the forests of the world. Um, on the second slide, you'll see the expansion that is predicted just in the international trade of wood pellets. You see that Europe was um, a great big uh, demand center in 2017, but that South Korea and Japan expand by 2027 to also be massive demand centers. And then you can see that the demand is beginning to come out of the forests of Southeast Asia Africa and South America, as well as Canada, the US, Russia, Australia, um, uh, Eastern Europe, um, and, uh, and so on. Uh, this is just the trade in wood pellets. This is not everything being used for forest biomass energy. This doesn't count the internal use, which is also huge in some of these um, places. And neither does it count the trade in other things like wood chips because we couldn't disaggregate them from wood chip for pulp and paper production. But we know, for example, in one instance, here we see Japan having um, increased from 0.5 million tonnes to 9 million tonnes in 10 years. Um, however, when I read um, uh, one of the uh, uh, industry magazines, um, they are predicting that Japan will actually, in 2025, be using 23 million tonnes of wood products to produce biomass energy. It's impossible to imagine that this can be sustainably supplied from the world's forests, and, and there are issues even if it was a sustainable form of production, which it won't be. So the impacts on indigenous peoples. Clearly, forests that are home and property of indigenous peoples and have been for millennia are under threat because of this new driver of forest degradation and um, it possibly, and in some cases, deforestation. Now we know the issues really with forests, don't we? Um, that this type of incursion of mass commodity production undermines community rights and interests. That demand uh, can and will, and in fact it already is, exacerbating conflicts over land and forests, and it leads to land grabbing. We're particularly seeing that land grabbing at the moment for biomass energy in South America, where plantations are being established on, um, on community lands that have been grabbed. Um, that were uh, grasslands and savannah, uh, and those uh, plantations are being used for charcoal burning um, uh, to then fuel um, the uh, industrial production of soy. Uh, so this occurs in natural forests and also uh, uh, and by appropriation for plantation uh, establishment. So as I'm outline, outlining here, this has a massive impact in degrading natural forests and in, um, in also uh, leading to conversion. And of course, it is, all, is so frequently, not just in developing countries, but in developed countries too, at the expense of the indigenous communities. It impacts the rights and interests of uh, these people, it impacts their lives, 
their livelihoods and their cultural values. We're talking about indigenous people, tribal people and local communities. And it gets to the extreme of impacting food security. Furthermore, of course, uh, there are other ways in which human health and well-being are, are affected. In particular, uh, when forests are degraded and destroyed for a commodity like this or any of the other commodities, it undermines the important role of forests in safeguarding these communities from the worst impacts of climate change. And the communities on the forest frontiers are often the very most vulnerable communities. So here we've got something being done in the name of tackling climate change that is actually already affecting indigenous and traditional communities and it's going to get an awful lot worse unless we do something about it. Thanks. So quickly to go through the root cause and solutions. This is being sold as a solution to climate change but it's not low carbon. It isn't carbon neutral. When you burn wood, it immediately emits carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. It's actually more emissive per unit of energy than burning coal, but it takes decades or centuries to regrow and sequester. That's well outside our 10 to 12 years that we've got in the Paris Agreement timeframes. And all the while, it's contributing to warming, regardless of whether it's adhered to some sustainability criteria. This happens because of flawed carbon accounting and reporting. That's why I was here at IPCC this week, to see if they would do anything about it. But this fundamental problem wasn't changed. Emissions at the power station are reported and accounted as zero in the energy sector, compared to the emissions for fossil fuels, which are actually shown. So it looks like it doesn't hit the atmosphere. It's meant to be reported and accounted in the land sector, and that gets very gnarly because you never actually see the specific emissions there if you see um, any type of emission or stock change noted at all. So we have to do something to have about this by ending that perverse incentive and by ending so that comes from the reporting and accounting and also ending subsidies for large scale um, biomass burning. We need to protect and restore natural forests instead, and of course that should be under Indigenous ownership and control. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Takako, Takako Moimoi, Secretary General of the Kiko Network in Tokyo office. She's experiencing climate action through work with environmental NGOs and policymakers offices. And she's especially well familiar with the domestic coal and energy issues on climate change policy. Thank you very much, Junine. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And thank you very much for this. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and have a short presentation. And today I'm focusing on Japan uh, Japan's climate and energy policy and using some slides. Okay. Okay. And please put your earphone of translation <laughs> receiver. Please, I'd like to ask English user. Let me have a presentation in Japanese from here. とりまで、あの、愛の方の問題意識ということと、え、
削減目標の中長期の目標になりますで2030年に2013年度比で 26% 削減という、まあ、非常に低いと言われている目標を、えー、掲げておりますで2050年には 80% 削減ということで、えー、先日あの日本の長期戦略の政府案というのが示されたんですけれども、まあ、そこでもまあこの目標に向けてやっていくという方針が示されましたつまりこれがあの非常に低いと言われているのは 1.5 度の IPCC のレポートが出されて、まあ、そこに向けて大幅な削減が求められているにもかかわらず、まあ、中期の目標としてはあの非常に低い目標であるということがまず大前提としてあります。次のスライドお願いしますえこれはあの日本の,あの排出を示しているものです日本の排出の,あのそれぞれの排出の割合なんですけれども、まあ、とりわけ大きいのが電力部門ですでこの電力部門においてはあの 35% を今占めていてこれがまあ火力発電から出されているものということになります、まあ、それ以外にあの鉄鋼ですとか化学工業ですとか、まあ、非常に大きな排出事業者によって、えー、日本の,あの CO2 の排出というのがありまして、えー、省エネ法という法律のもとであの今あのデータが大口の排出事業者のデータが集められているんですけれどもその対象となっているもの事業者が1万5千事業所約1万,事業所1万5千事業所ありますでこの1万5千事業所のうちのわずか130の事業所で、えー、日本全体の半分の排出を占めているということになりますでそのうちの、えー、まあわずかに、まあ、40事業所ぐらいいが電力部門だととうことですですので、まあ、ここをあのきちんと排出の削減の取り組みというのを政策的に進めていけばあの大幅な削減が可能になっていくということになると思いますで次のスライドお願いしますで、まあ、大きな排出を占めている 35% の排出を占めている、えー電力部門についてなんですけれども今、日本の電力需要の構造を見てみますと、えー、再生可能エネルギーは、まあ、10% ちょっとになりますで、えー、それ以外が今は大半が火力発電ですでその火力発電の中でも半,半分弱ぐらい4割ぐらいが石炭火力によるものということになっていましてまあ、本来であればこの火力部門を大幅に減らしていってで省エネも進め再生可能エネルギーを大きく増やしていくということが求められますしかし政府が出している今のエネルギーの方針というのを見ますと2030年にえ再生可能エネルギーが22から 24% それから天然ガスで 27% 石炭が 26% それから原子力をまあ20から 22% というふうにまあこれからまた大幅に増やすということがあの掲げられておりまあこれが今大前提になって気候変動政策もあの位置づけられているというところがまあ非常に大きな問題ですで石炭が特に CO2 の排出が大きいということでまあこれをまずはあの少なく遅くとも2030年までには全部削減していくというのが、まあ、今 1.5 度を目標としていく中では必要とされていることだと思いますそして多くの国々イギリスとかカナダとかフランスとか、まあ、先進国の多くの国が、まあ、こうした2030年までの全廃というのをあの政策として取っていっていると。いうことになると思うんですけれども日本はまあこの先2030年に 26% にもあの位置づけているということで非常に大きな問題ですでこれまであのかつて石炭はあの、えー、北海道とか、まあ、先ほどアイムのお話あったんです北海道とか九州とか日本の中で取れていたんですけれども現時点ではほぼ 100% 
オーストラリアとかインドネシアからの輸入のものになりますですので、まあ、海外での、まあ、そういう掘られているものっていうのに大きく依存していることが問題であるというふうに考えていますで次のスライドお願いしますまあ、ここはあの日本だけが G7 の国の中でこれから先も石炭を増やしていこうとしているということを表しているものですで、えー、2つスライド飛ばしていただきましてあの時間がないのでその次まで飛ばしてもらっていいですかはいその次も飛ばしてくださいで、えー、再生可能エネルギーに関しての位置づけがまた非常に低いということも一方で問題としてありますでその再エネに関してはあの今現状では、えー、再生可能エネルギーの固定価格買い取り制度が導入されているんですけれども、えー、なかなかあの、まあ、この先はそれがお金も安く設定されているということとオークションが導入されるということもあってあの非常に伸びが鈍くなってきているという状況がありますそういう中であの市民があの自ら共同発電所を作って、えー、これから導入していこうというのが、まあ、あの今急激に日本の中でも増えているという状況がありますで次のスライドに行きますと、えーまあ、私たち気候ネットワークでもこういう市民があの自分たちでエネルギーを作っていくという方向性をえきちんあの支えている地域の動きというのを支えていくということでえ活動をしておりましてまあこれもあの世界の皆様に知っていただきながらあのこういう動きを増やしていけたらなというふうに思っているところですすいません時間がなくてありがとうございました。Thank you very much. So, our last speaker is Dr. Adrian Bani l a s e m b a g founder of Indigenous Peoples Network of Malaysia. He is also a member of the Malaysian Senate and has worked for over 20 years with the Indigenous Peoples Movement in Malaysia, a well known advocate for renewable energy and community sustainable development. Thank you very much.、Um, first of all, I'd like to thank, the、uh, thank this opportunity to thank the organizers for. Uh, having me here.、Um, I'd like to change,、uh, share a little bit of、uh, the Malaysian experience and, and also the indigenous people's、uh, perspective of the climate change and how、uh, things have been going and、uh, what should we do as an international community towards respecting indigenous peoples when we、uh, draw towards policies of、uh, mitigating、uh, climate change.、Uh, let me start by just、uh, looking at my general observation that. The last、uh, many talks,、uh, forums,、uh, there's a lot of talks about you know, policy level,、uh, quantifying carbons, and, and so on, etc. Et But um, uh, we have very little uh, actually um, ad advances in terms of recognizing the rights of indigenous people when it comes to、um, climate change mitigation methods. And、um, I would like to、uh, share a little bit of what we had ha、um, ha faced in Malaysia. So,、uh, we, we have a lot of、uh, target to. Can I get the slide, please?、Um, I'd like to、uh, share a little bit of community based approach.、Uh, why、uh, indigenous communities are very important in terms of having indigenous peoples'、um, you know, participation in terms of、uh, renewable energy.、Uh, it's not just about、uh, addressing climate change, but it's also to help them having access. Towards uh, electricity. Um, many uh, indigenous peoples,、uh, in, but in particular in Malaysia, they're still living in、uh, very remote areas and we don't have electricity to, towards uh, uh, these communities. But、uh, what we have done in Malaysia is basically empowering the communities on themselves to build and own and operate their own micro hydro systems instead of waiting for the government to、uh, connect all these communities. Um, in doing so, we actually、uh, have the opportunity to empower the communities、uh, and also uh, develop uh, technologies that is suitable and appropriate for、uh, the communities in, in the、uh, rural areas. And、uh, with regards to Malaysia, we are、uh, looking at two, two prong a p p r o a c h which is looking at forestry and also、uh, um, Larger installation of renewable energy. But unfortunately, when we talk about uh, renew, uh, renewable energy, 
large mega dams comes into place. And uh, where I come from, in the island of Borneo, we have like uh, hundreds of dams have been, uh, you know, planned uh, in the name of climate change mitigation to reduce, you know, uh, emission and so on. But uh, we know that large dams doesn't uh, produce uh, much of, uh, actually there's a lot of emission from these dams. So uh, what, what is happening is indigenous people communities becomes the victim of what we call climate change mitigation. We have seen large scale um, you know, uh, displacement of indigenous peoples when these dams were constructed. Uh, for example, the 2,400 megawatts Bakun Dam in Sarawak. It displaced at least 15,000 uh, over 15 communities of in indigenous communities. And there are more dams being planned for this, all in the name of climate change. Um, the, because uh, the energy mix of Malaysia is so uh, coal and also natural gas dependent. So in order for them to reduce the uh, no, uh, dependency towards uh, fossil fuel, uh, dams or hydro, large scale hydro have been one of the uh, solution. The other uh, option uh, that Malaysia is looking at in terms of uh, you know, f um, for, for their targets is also forest, uh, protected areas. And a lot of people see protected is, er, areas is good. I, I'm not saying that the protected areas is bad, but in the process of uh, gazetting or making sure that these protected areas is being you know, earmarked for conservation, there's no consultation with the people. In the end, when they have uh, you know, a management plan in place in this, people get also displaced or denied access to where used to be traditionally the hunting area, foraging area, and so on. And it's actually giving a very, very negative impact towards the socioeconomy uh, of the people where uh, most of the indigenous peoples who depend on the forest uh, resources have been uh, deprived uh, of their, their natural uh, socioeconomic uh, income. Um, lastly, I think uh, we have not looked too much towards um, uh, how small scale, micro scale versus the large dams. We can see this is Bakun Dam. And uh, on the right side is actually a micro hydro system where these micro hydro systems benefits the community directly and this system is actually owned and maintained and operated by the communities. And we just need a little bit of uh, you know, um, training and also empowerment towards the community that they, they can benefit uh, directly. And in the same time, the watershed area for, for the micro hydro system is actually protected because that is one form of incentive for the community to protect and make sure that the forest remain intact. Um, over the years, I have installed more than 30 systems like this uh, in Malaysia, just through our NGO. There are many other NGOs also doing this. But it, the impact was uh, most of the funding never came from development grant. It's all conservation grant. So what we're saying is the conservation community can also look at uh, a, a approach where, um, you know, uh, conservation can play a role in terms of bringing sustainable development to the communities so long that they can uh, be able to be uh, uh, putting the communities um, uh, up front. So um, I was also part of the uh, recently launched Right Energy Partnership. And I think this Right Energy Partnership that was uh, started by the, the Indigenous Peoples Major Group in SDG is actually a good platform for communities like this to be able to have access to funding and also uh, guide uh, or support. Uh, because without the funding and also the uh, technical support, the communities, especially the rural communities, will not have access to it. So I think um, in, to end my presentation, uh, community-based approach uh, have the potential of actually bridging the gap of what uh, the policy uh, the, the, the government policies and also the grassroots communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our panelists shared many important aspects today and I just want to bring back a lot of the important points in context of what we heard earlier in the morning sessions. 
In a lot of spaces, we often hear this emphasis pit on the need to create private par public partnerships and the need to work uh, across different sectors to develop the solutions that we need, but very rarely do you hear in the same context the need to partner with indigenous peoples, although they are impacted on almost every aspect of the development of these solutions, whether it's in looking at the source of raw materials or it's looking at where the waste is ending up, you will find indigenous populations that are being impacted. Indigenous populations who are the core of nature-based solutions. It is exciting to see the opportunities that are being created with the use of this language uh, and, and growing in spaces where it wasn't common. But when we talk about nature-based solutions, indigenous people should be at the lead of discussing what that is because their languages, their ways of life, their stewardship practices, and their vision for the future is all nature-based. And so it makes sense that they would be at the decision-making table, if not at least acknowledged in these discussions about where we need to go in the future direction of our globe. I bring this up because in many cases we can, we, we have so many examples and experiences of well-meaning projects having unintended consequences on indigenous populations that are separated and divided, are erased from visibility in these discussions. A public-private partnership in one country with a company that is, may be successful in promoting sustainable solutions will most likely also have ties in another country and the, and the violation of indigenous people's rights. We need to hold ourselves to higher standards if we really want to take the call that was mentioned so often in the morning presentations of Greta Thornburg to do something radical and drastic to make the, the, make the changes that we need. Oftentimes we talk about the importance of our youth and I'm glad Greta is getting so much attention for the words that she shared, but these words weren't new. These are words that have been shared by indigenous peoples and by youth around our globe for several generations. And it's about time that we're listening, but we can't need to do more than listen. We need to take meaningful action because those same youth, although there are some that hold hope and there are, are pit on platforms and are supported in the work that they're doing, there are many others who are losing that hope. And we're seeing the rise of youth suicide in our communities. We're seeing the rise of fascism in our countries. We're seeing the rise of, of politics of hate and of divide at a time when we could least afford it. And so the only way to combat these things is by ensuring that in every space that we create, we take serious steps towards not only recognizing the importance of a rights-based approach, but the meaningful action that needs to be taken to honor that. And that's why it's an honor to be here at the Global Landscape Forums, which has embraced not only the participation and the leadership of indigenous peoples, but also the commitment towards taking a rights-based approach to landscape management. And it is one of the things that we need to take in every fora in every uh, conference, in every space that we are in, because it is, it is the only way to develop the solutions that we need. And so I want to give our panelists another round of applause, please. And I, we have time for question and answers because we knew it would be important to create this dialogue with our audience because there's so much more that they could not cover. And so uh, we're going to pass it on. I guess we have a, a floating microphone now. あ、<笑><笑> え、
、えー、と森を守る運動を始めてもう今年で26年経ちますでなぜ始めたかといったら、えー、ニブタニに作ろうとしているダム、えー、ダムなんて私はいらないという考えです要するに洪水調整のダム,ダムなんていらないと洪水やなんかを防ぐならば森が健全であれば絶対洪水なんて起きないとそういうことを考えて、えー、森を守る運動を始めましたで最大の目的は北海道先ほども話したように、えー、本州から入ってきた人たちによって見事に自然が破壊されましたも,もともと以前はその北海道の大自然の中でアイヌの人たちは自然と仲良く自然から生活の糧をいただいて生きていた民族なんですねそれを見事に壊されてしまったですからダムに反対する傍らよし北海道の本当の森を取り戻そうと森を取り戻すには200年300年かかるかもしれない先ほどまだ26年目ですから私が死んでもまだ半世紀以上本当の森は取り,取り戻せないと思いますがその中で子どもたちが森で学ぶ場所アイヌ文化を伝承できる場所そんな場所が将来的にできたら嬉しいなとそれが最終的な目的で本当のアイヌが自然と共に生きていたそしてその幸に感謝して生きていた。そんな森が取り戻せればと思ってやってますけれどあと200年後になるでしょうということです Other questions? And if there's anyone else,、um, please raise your hand as soon as you think of your question. That way we can get you the microphone or know where to, to locate. You know,、uh, this is more of a comment actually for you, Janine. I just wanted to thank you for you know, calling that out that we do need to explicitly mention indigenous people, local communities, rights, livelihoods in all of these discussions. And I think two things that, you know, from our panel in the morning that, that should be mentioned as sort of a follow up. The Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force, this sort of network that's promoting these jurisdictional approaches, last year adopted a set of principles of collaboration between subnational governments and indigenous people and local communities in their territories. And this was actually historic and the result of long collaboration and discussions with, with, with local people and people in that network. And the second is that at this Tropical Forest Alliance meeting, Just last week, which is a lot of private companies, it was heartening to see that there was not only indigenous people representatives on that stage and in those discussions, but a clear commitment from these company actors to say, We understand this concern. We're start, you know, it's, it's, it's getting in the narrative at least, even if it's not yet in practice, at least it's starting to, to be there and be present and be visible. So, thank you for that. Any other questions? So I'm going to ask our panelists to give some closing thoughts,、uh, starting with Adrian. Yeah,、uh, thank you very much. I think my、uh, last thoughts、uh, for this forum、uh, or this panel is to look at、um, how we can、um, effectively engage the communities. Because、uh, what is、uh, troubling is actually we don't have a Proper platform. In fact, the national government, even, even though they sign on to a lot of these、uh, international treaties,、uh, actually there's very little happening on the, on, the, on the ground, especially in the provisional and the district level.、Um, so we have to really、uh, take into task our national governments to really uh, push um, uh, you know, the grassroots and also the local government、uh, implementation of what their commitment in the international level. Uh, it, there seems to be a disconnect.、Um, when I first、uh, started, I mean, being appointed as a senator,、uh, the first thing I noticed is very clear that there's, there's a huge disconnect between what the government, our governments, is saying in, in the international level, in the international forum, and what is actually happening on the ground. 
and um, the, ro the role of the civil society is actually very important to make sure that uh, whatever commitments that our governments have signed on has, has to be implemented and especially to or the commitments towards providing indigenous peoples the voice um, uh, and then um, also the uh, subscribing to the, uh, uh, the policy, uh, policies of free and informed consent. Thank you. え、今日はどうもありがとうございました。え、私はあの石炭の問題に取り組んでいて、今日も少しその話にフォーカスを当てました。で、この石炭の問題というのは、あの燃やした時に CO2が出て気候変動を加速するというだけではなくて、ま、
And that's what's going to guide us forward, not measuring our solutions based on GDP or scaling up our economic growth, but measuring it by the quality of life that we create for all living things and the way that we collaborate to bring that reality to life. Thank you.